So Chris, thanks again for taking the time to chat. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so I'm Chris Yume. I'm a VFX artist and AI artist as well. Um, I've been working as a VFX artist for about 12 years now, I think, mainly in Belgium for a lot of television companies. And I think three to four years ago, I started experimenting with few AI technologies. And one of those was deepfake. Uh, I started working uh, with, with deepfake and the creative possibilities. I got hired by uh, Deep Food Studio South Park, uh, Matt and Trey, um, two and a half years ago. Um, because I was publishing all my work online. And after that, I've been at South Park for one and a half year. Then I came out with my deep Tom Cruise videos where I worked with Miles Fisher, the actor, uh, making uh, synthetic videos of Tom Cruise doing silly things. That went viral. And after that, I met Tom Graham. And uh, together with him, I founded a company uh, called Metaphysic. Ethics are on the forefront and we create uh, projects using AI technology and we develop AI technology as well. I love that. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, I think that um, he yeah, has a lot that uh, I'd love to chat about in regards to ethics, especially. So I, yeah. I was curious starting out, um, did you early in your life, like growing up, did you always expect to be in some kind of creative role uh, when you, you know, got into what you're doing? Well, when I was young, I was always trying to figure out things. I didn't think like, this is what I'm going to do, or this is what it's going to be. I just always thought like, I want to have fun and enjoy myself, right? And that's how I got into all these creative things. Uh, I remember back in the day, I had like a small music band and we, we, we wanted to create our, our first music video. And I didn't have a camera back then. So I just had like a, a photo camera. So I told everyone like, okay, let's do everything in slow motion. So if I take pictures quick enough and I speed it up somehow, it will look like a video, right? And that's just, I love, I just loved figuring out these things. And I didn't think what I was going to do later on. I just wanted to enjoy myself. And that's how I grew on into all of these things, actually. That's cool. I love that. Because, yeah, I was, I was actually just talking with a buddy of mine yesterday about his kids getting into certain kind of art things like visual effects. And, you know, again, it's one of those things that you find something that you're passionate about. So with my friend's son, it was hey, I can modify the skins, the textures in video games. If that's your, a way to kind of get you intrigued about it, it means that through through that one passion, you can adopt another. So that's really cool. I think with your friend, for example, they're already being confronted with top tier technology, like mm -hmm. TikTok, for example, the different ways of green screening yourself or putting effects on top of yourself is amazing. Like if they're already doing those kind of things right now, well, it's, it's a quite a bright future ahead of a lot of young people. Pretty exciting. Um, I was curious too, like just to dive right into deep fakes, because I know we're going to cover a lot uh, in the area, but for you, like when did you first get introduced into doing deep fakes? I think it's difficult to pinpoint it, but like it's four years ago, I think. Um, I was still working at a Belgian te television company as a VFX artist and doing these things. And it was like the news bulletin where there was like, they were talking about this new technology, deepfake, and being, being misused. And when I saw that, I was immediately intrigued by the technology itself, right? Like, yeah, but that technology is interesting, like creatively, right? Not, not people misusing it, but creatively. So I started looking up the technology. What is this? How does it work? And it was really vague. Um, but that's how I got into contact with, with the technology. And that's when I started fantasizing about creative, creative um, possibilities using this technology. Yeah, I, I think it's really fascinating. Like, I'm curious for you, you know, did it instantly kind of resonate? Like, holy crap, like there's so much potential here to do so much. Yeah, yeah. I immediately started thinking about, for example, de-aging someone's face. I, I think that was straightforward. Um, also, um, deep faking uh, an actor's face on, on stunt doubles. I think that's straightforward as well. Uh, uh, in the past, you had to find a lot of, uh, when you're using stunt doubles, it's always like the back of the head and, and don't show the face, but that's a thing of the past. And that was already my first thing I was thinking of. Uh, was also the, the second video I ever made using this technology was actually, uh, there were two things. The first video I ever made was bringing back 
a legend. He's a Belgian legend, a Belgian singer. And uh, uh, there was this artist doing a, a, a cover of his song. And he had permission of the family to do the song and, 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 and to work with his music. And somehow I came in contact with his manager and we were brainstorming about like, hey, let's do a music video for him. And that's when I told his manager like, I, I, I found this technology and I'm not sure how to use it, but I think it's quite cool. It's interesting. And I was talking with him about it. And, and somehow we came up with the idea like, what if we do a music video where your artist is, is standing on a stage performing the song in front of an empty hall, like an empty, empty, big empty hall. And there's like one seat and one, one guy is walking, walking. Uh, getting closer and closer and, and, and in the end he's sitting on the uh, on the on the chair and he's clapping like he loves it and then we saw who that guy is and of course it's the legend we're bringing back and That's the so family crazy. liked the idea uh, and we we pulled it off it took me four to five months to get it done it wasn't great but the idea was cool and I think that's the first that's the first thing I, I, I did with the technology and the second video I did was mob manipulation that's where I made this video of Jon Snow uh, is a famous scene in, in Game of Thrones uh, saying sorry for uh, season 8 for of Game of Thrones mm -hmm. it was meant to be something funny because a lot of people had the same feeling and I made sure it's a famous scene I have put my name in, 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 in big in the corner to make sure uh, people realized it's a parody and it went all over the world and I knew it's the first time that this is happening so News are going to pick it up. It's the ideal moment to raise for awareness as well. That's so great. And it's such a great idea as well. In, in a lot of ways, like getting that traction, putting your name on things, like getting that notoriety, was that there's some intent there. So that way you're building your brand, you're getting recognition to be able to do potentially, you know, future things. Or what was the idea behind that? I immediately realized the potential of this technology. I, I, I realized it's going to get big is going to get to a higher level of quality. Uh, and, and I just know it's going to get to that point where it's going to be usable for commercials, for movies, for all these kind of things. So I just figured like, look, if I focus and I get better and better and keep experimenting, keep doing things with this technology that no one has ever done, Huh? For example, uh, doing translations from English to French or whatever, using this technology, well, someone has to notice me eventually, right? I just keep posting stuff, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And eventually someone has to pick it up because one of my dreams, and it, it, it's not, it's not a, um, something people don't know. Uh, I had a few dreams, like one day I wanted to work with Peter Jackson, work on a new Lord of the Rings. That's the big dream of me. Uh, I also had a dream working with Matt and Trey, like that was a big one as well. Mm -hmm. um, and to get there, you just have to keep pushing keep pushing stuff up. So I had my Instagram channel and I kept push pushing all of my VFX stuff, all my videos on there. So people would, would start recognizing my work. And, and eventually, eventually, if they need someone, they mm -hmm. might they might find me and might give me a call. I love that because I think it's something that a lot of people overlook. They're always frustrated that they're not getting the jobs they want, things like that, but they're not really putting intent behind attracting the right kind of people to the right kind of projects they want to do such as deep fakes yeah. and just in general like you got to be out there to you know build awareness that you're you're there yeah. you know hire me but, it's great but there's one thing that i might add to that what i did as well is i was living in belgium working for a, a big tele belgian television company i was doing all the vfx all all the things that were in-house which weren't normal and as in, if it was something special, I had to do it. Huh? So if there was motion design or commercials, I also did freelance work. So I was really busy. And I also had a lot of family in France. So the, the issue I had was if I stayed in Belgium, I would have still been working for that company, doing all those things. I couldn't focus on what I had. So I had, my, I had an uncle, he's living in Bangkok. He has been living here for 30 years. So um, for me, it made sense to escape, escape my life there. Uh, mm -hmm. And with the work, what I was doing, um, to escape, to move to Thailand. So I was in a new environment and I could 24 seven focus on doing what I had to do. So that's the reason why I moved to Thailand in the beginning. And it made sense going to my uncle, not alone, 
And that was the best decision because I was all alone. And the only thing I was doing, creating content, creating content, uploading it on YouTube, uploading it on Instagram, making things, doing small freelance uh, projects for customers. And I was getting some interviews, some, some press, and that's how it all started. Mm -hmm. That's great. You, you want to create an environment where you can really thrive. And with that too, like, uh, cause I know we talked about this right before we started talking, you know, uh, recording, but I'm kind of curious for you, did COVID help in terms of a lot of studios kind of, um, loosening up their security a little bit, be more open-minded to working remotely? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. Both right after I moved to Thailand, I, as I said, I started working on my video projects and I started uploading a lot of stuff. And I think three months after I arrived in Thailand, that was two months before COVID hit, or maybe one month before COVID hit, uh, I got a call from uh, from from Matt and Trey from South Park. And they called me like, hey, we saw your stuff online. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, no, this is not, this is <laughs> not reality. But it was. And a week later, I was sitting in LA with my brother, on the same in the same room with Matt and Trey having a conversation about what we're gonna do and I was in LA for two weeks it was all going great like the plan was move to LA start working there and uh, but then uh, COVID broke out exactly that moment so after two weeks I had to come back and we started working remotely contract was signed the whole team was was on on board so we started working remotely and and we had to finalize like we were working on a tv and a and a, and a, co and a pilot uh, of this tv show called sassy justice so we had to work remotely and that's what we did for one and a half years from that moment yeah um yeah i'd love to talk about that because i'm so angry that there's not a episode two or three or anything so um for that, what was that experience like in general? But also, in fact, let's just start there. I'm kind of curious, like for you, like what was that experience like getting to work on that project and kind of moving to new territory? I'm sure for everyone involved, it was fairly new. Yeah, well, it was it was, it was like another dream come true. And one dream was like when I started working, I started working in Belgium for, for the radio. Then I went to this television company, it was absurd. Then South Park comes along, like it's, it's, it's on my bucket list. South Park is my, my two idols, right? It's insane. You, you, you start talking with them and they're like so down to earth. They're such nice people, these two guys. And at the same time, I also met Peter Serafinovich. He's this, he's a, a famous British comedian, actor as well. Uh, I hope he's not going to be angry if I miss, uh, mm -hmm. miss uh, introduce him somehow, but he's, uh, he's like a really good friend of me now. I still hear him. And, um, it was actually, it was insane working at that place. Uh, you're working at a top tier Hollywood studio with top tier talent. They're, they're just humans, like the way they're communicating with you, like they're calling on a daily basis, doing some FaceTimes, talking about the project, uh, how we're going to approach things. I loved every moment of it. I learned a lot. Um, and yeah, how was it? It's, it's, it's difficult to explain. It was, it was, I think, I think it was hard work. Eh? I had to do my best. Uh, but I, I, I love that. That's the only way to get better, right? Like if I create something, I love, I love for them to have critique on it and have harsh feedback because that's the only way I'm going to get better. So that's what I loved about it. So I think it was great working for them. I, I, I'm not sure how I can, uh, what I can uh, say, say about it. Um, yeah. No, that's, that's really cool. I mean, yeah, I, I'm sure it would have been a pretty amazing experience. And with Sassy Justice, I'm curious for you, like, what were some of the challenges with pulling off a project like that? I think a few things, and then that's the experience as well. The level of humor these guys have is next level. There are so many things that didn't go in and, and they had other projects in their head as well. We were working on at the same time and it's all so funny. It's unbelievable. So that was great, to be honest. Um, that's, that's one. But there were a lot of things uh, because the technology was quite new on how to solve certain things eh? um, as in the technology couldn't manage certain camera angles, for example, or 
we were having likeness issues uh, because Peter Serafino, which was was doing uh, was doing um, Trump uh, or Sassy, uh, that's uh, Fred Sassy is, is the character's name. Peter was doing that, but there are some likeness issues uh, because the, the the shape of the head, the face, it's it's not even remotely similar. So um, we were having yeah technical uh, ways of solving it and it's not always straightforward because you have to realize the technology is like windows 98 and we're currently having windows 11 20 years later so you have to solve things using this windows 98 version and it's not easy i'm not sure how far i can go in depth about certain specific issues but we managed to get to a quite a top tier quality product that we delivered with the resources we had the, uh, technology wise it's all, it's only been a, a year and a half right now I, I i totally get that but the tech is developing so quick it's a big ch- it's a big difference uh, uh with what we at metaphysic right now have than what we had at the Fudo a year and a half ago and i'm sure they've been developing as well so they've been uh, making big steps as well. That's really cool. I'm curious too, like, what are some of the biggest challenges in creating deep fakes right now? And also how close are we to conquering the Uncanny Valley? I think the biggest challenge is it's always something different. And with that, I mean, with every project, there are like certain technical issues. Uh, and if, if it's, for example, if we have to revive a certain person, um, I think the biggest challenge there is, first and f- and, uh, first of all, is gathering the data the clients. Uh, the client always um, gives us certain data to work with. Uh, how are we going to work with that data? Because it's mostly really old, not that high quality. How are we going to? Uh, how are we going by with restoration of that data? Uh, for example, if we want to to, to revive Elvis, for example we'll need good quality data of Elvis because otherwise if you if, if you the stuff you're putting in is crap well what's what's coming out isn't going to be uh, mm-hmm. pretty uh, good either I think that's a challenge w- when you're working with old old uh, faces uh, estates of Marilyn Monroe and, 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 and people like that lighting conditions as well uh, uh, or obstructions it's a big challenge for deep face as well when you have a look-alike or someone acting, somehow, sometimes the expression is like, you can look like someone, right? But when you're smiling or you're doing something facially, it mm-hmm. maybe doesn't really resemble, uh, it, it, it looks like how the, 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 the actor you want to deep fake does it. For example, if you have Trump, I think that's a really good example, Trump. Whenever he's looking or when he's smiling on the side of his mouth, left and right, he has this thing. He's always looking sad. He's always looking sad. Even when he's smiling, he's looking sad, right? And that's something that's really difficult for a lookalike to mimic. Um, And you have certain technical uh, solutions to do that. it, it means you have to go in the face before you start deep faking, start altering the face before you start even doing it. Because you have to know that when you, you're deep faking on a certain person, you're changing the, the way that person looks, but you're not changing how one um, does certain expressions. So if I, if I deep fake Trump on top of your face, it's 80% Trump, it's going to be 20% you. That's the mix. That's the, the 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 middle ground somewhere. That's why we have to fine tune you as much as possible to look as uh, look like Trump. And there are a lot of things you you, ha- you have to keep in mind there. The the, the difference of uh, uh, the how far are the eyes apart? How big is your nose? How does your mouth look, shape looks like? Especially when you're smiling or when you're talking. How do how do your cheeks move? when you're talking like there are a lot of things you have to keep in mind and i think that those are all technical difficulties and they're probably going to get solved in the in the next few years uh, when we're int- introducing different ais on top of what we're doing already but for now those are dif- uh, technical difficulties um when we're doing uh translations of of, of uh for client uh, for example we also do translations uh, mm-hmm. in my company 
where we have an English commercial and they want to do it in French, then there are a lot of different things because you can change what someone's saying, but you cannot change body language. So if you're saying three words in English and I'm, and I have to translate that and I have a French voiceover or a new voice doing five words, well, when, when you're breathing, it doesn't make sense to have the French guy to make him uh, to, uh, to have him still talking because the body language won't match to what's being said right mm. so that's a total different issue yeah no I, I think this is really fascinating and um all of these things you don't really think about until you have to be solving them my question was um just how close do you think we are to uh conquering the uncanny valley i think we're really close to that i think deep tom and 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 the models I've been using for that are quite old right now, so there are new ones coming up. We're quite close, I think, especially if you look at how people are reacting to, to him, interacting with him. It's, 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 I think Deep Tom is, is a prime example of one of the first deep fakes to somehow cross the Uncanny Valley, partially, I think. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we're really close. To, to really uh, covering that, to be honest. That's cool. Um, I was curious too, like where you see all of this heading, especially both for entertainment, but also outside of entertainment too. Um, well, I have a few dreams uh, and that's, I think in 10 years time, we'll look back uh, at, at, because this is uh, just to be clear, synthetic media in general is going to revolutionize the whole industry. It's going to revolutionize how we create content how we absorb content, how we how we enjoy content. And with that, I mean is um, big changes that are going to come is, for example, translations. Mm -hmm. That's one big, big thing where uh, at the moment we're doing commercials, right? So, so let's say Nike, uh, if Nike has to create a commercial that's going around the world, that probably at the moment, they probably do it like in five languages, uh, English, French, uh, German, I guess, um, uh, Spanish, and probably Chinese or whatever. Um, and they'll look for actors that can speak all of those languages. If they cannot do it, they'll look for actors which can phonetically learn how to speak those languages. If that doesn't work out, they'll find for different actors for each country. That means they'll have to do it in separate recording days. And if they have one actor who can do all, it'll be an extremely, extremely long day of recording. Now, if we start using the technology that we are, uh, with my company, what we are working on right now, that means they ha they'll have to do it just in English. And then we get the videos and we can translate it to whatever language you want. And uh, sometimes we even uh, partner up with a, a synthetic audio company where they can for example, they can just uh, replicate the original actor's voice even. Eh? So so I could be doing uh, in Dutch because I'm from Belgium. I could be doing the Dutch voiceover. And if it's a female leading the, the, the role in that commercial, they just could use her voice filter on top of mine. So now she's speaking Dutch with her, with her voice and you don't even see it's fake. Like now you have an English, uh, you, you did a recording of an English uh, commercial in a few hours. Uh, it only took a few hours and you can translate it to whatever language you want. So it's opening up a ton of new markets. Yes. Same thing goes for movies. Eh? You have all of these foreign movies that, that are not going worldwide because they're only in one language. And sometimes you have like a, an American producer who buys the rights and they do a remake, right? The mm -hmm. issue here is, is all go, always going to be an American version of that movie. But what if you could take this Swedish movie and you could just start using AI to translate it to English? You'll still have that Swedish style in that movie, but it'll be completely English. And it opens up a whole new market as well. So I think that's interesting. Um, we did a project with Reese Beecher. That's the uh, synthetic audio company, by the way. They're amazing at what, what, they're, what they're doing. And we did it, uh, a project with Alu Black, that's the singer of uh, Wake Me Up uh, of Avicii. And we made him sing the song in English, Chinese, and Spanish. 
and he doesn't speak those languages. So wow. you can see a music video on his YouTube channel where you can see and you can hear him singing these languages, but he doesn't speak any of them. His voice is fully synthesized, like a singing voice, and the video as well. And it sounds and looks hyper real. So I think that's interesting as well. Like next time uh, in a few years, when Justin Bieber releases a new song, he'll just do it in Chinese, English, and Hindi. Like those are the big markets, right? And he'll be number one in all of those countries. And he doesn't even speak the language. So that's quite interesting, I think. Those are just uh, production things I'm thinking about. This is mob manipulation. This is not even. Uh, I'm not, now I'm not even talking about deep fake per se. It's, it, that's, that's something completely different. But I'm so intrigued by where this is all going. And for me, deep fake, face swap, it's just the beginning of all. And with that, I mean, we're, think, we're talking about the metaverse and it's something really vague. But if I, when I think about the metaverse and where this is all going, I, I, I always think about that movie, Ready Player One. I think that's a perfect example. And I can imagine in a couple of years that I'll, I'll have contact lenses or some type of sunglass on. And I'll be sitting on my table in my living room here in Bangkok having breakfast. And I'll call my grandparents and I'll tell them like, you wanna have breakfast together? And they're like, okay. And they're gonna sit on their table. And because I have the, the contact lens on and, and, and they're sitting in Belgium, it'll, and they'll, they'll sit with me on my table in Bangkok remotely and it'll feel hyper real it'll feel as if they're with me it's not like we are having contact now with a camera or face swap or what's up whatever uh it's not in a monitor no it's hyper real i can see them sitting in front of me i can have a talk with them we're having dinner together and i think that's amazing to to, to do that and at the same time um because currently with, with face swap, we're just focusing on the on the face, right? But it's just a matter of time before we start doing the whole body. And if we have all that data, that means we can regenerate it in the metaverse, hyper real. So I'll have that breakfast with my grandparents, hyper real. And let's say in 20 years' time, uh, when they're not when they're not uh, here anymore. Um, I could go back and revisit that memory and I'll never forget uh, what that memory looked and felt like. And I think that's an amazing thing to think about. And that's that's where I see this technology going. And I think that would be, it's, it's like a second life, right? It's a total different way of living. And I think we're moving towards that. It's really exciting because, uh, you know, I think for you and I growing up, you always think like, oh yeah, one day AI is going to do this or this or this, but it's one of those things that you kind of don't notice, but right now we are living in the the early stages of that. Like it's not a one day we'll get to experience this. Like I can't help but go on two minute papers several times a week just to see like what new things are popping up. So um, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty fascinating time for sure to just see like all these new innovations with AI, let alone where it's all headed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think now is the time to dream uh, because there are still so many things possible with this technology. How can we use it in, in creative ways? How can we use it to, to make people smile? To, to, to... Yeah, I, I think now is the time. Because I think that's why it's so exciting because ne no one has, has done this before. Now is the time to experiment. And it's like the landscape is still open. Like there are so much possibilities. And that's why I like to think about it. And what's really important and that's why I started Metaphysics, by the way, is now is the time to show the world and to show people how to use it ethically, how to use it in a way that it should be used. Uh, and with that, I mean, whenever I do a client, for example, it's we always have consent. We always have contracts where it's clear that we have consent from that certain person to do these kind of things. And I get it when you're doing parodies and, and, and things like that. There is a thin line, but uh, for example, with Deep Tom Cruise, because it's unavoidable that people will think about that, is that it's really important that whenever you're doing a parody, it's really important that you keep within lines that you're not offending a certain person. You're not using it for marketing. You're not doing it for product placement, all these kind of things, because then that's when you cross, cross that line. It's really important you keep that in mind and regulation is coming for sure. Mm -hmm. But we have to make sure people understand 
how it makes sense to use this technology. Uh, because a lot of people have a lot of power with this technology and you have to make sure you use it in a in a um, thoughtful way, if that's how you say it. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's such an important topic. I actually had the VFX supervisors from the show For All Mankind on uh, not too long ago, Jay Red and Todd Perry. And yeah. that's something that that show does quite a lot is deep fakes because you're changing history uh, in the show. So suddenly you have a president saying, something completely different, things like that. And ethics is always going to play a role of you're changing history and some people aren't going to understand that, hey, like this is a TV show, that thing that he said did not actually happen. And unfortunately, not always going to catch that. And I think, and, and I've been saying this quite a few times in the last year, is that with this technology as well, right? And that's what I did with Deep Tom Cruise as well. I'm trying to raise as much awareness as possible. That's also the reason why we're on the stage uh, of America's Got Talent. Mm -hmm. That's why we're standing there. That's why we're doing that, like showing people what's possible. Not to scare people. We want to show the, show the creative possibilities, right? But at the same time, 20 or 30 years ago when Photoshop came out, no one, no one realized that you could fake a photo. Now, if you would see a photo today, you would ask a few questions like, yeah, is this real? Uh, you'll ask and then you'll start researching it and, and, and then you'll find out if it's real or not. And the same thing has to happen with videos and audio as well in the, going forward. It's like a ref reflex we have to we have to adapt to that because if you go on Facebook and you go on Twitter, it's really hard to determine what's fake and what's real. So we're already having issues and this technology is not going to make it easier. So we'll have to adapt and, and that's where I, where I find myself to raise as much awareness as possible. So people understand what this technology can do and where it's going. I love that. Um, and you mentioned metaphysics. So you co-founded that in June, 2021. Um, what inspired you to start your own company? Well, after Deep Tom Cruise, we released Deep Tom Cruise in the beginning of March, end of February. Uh, my mailbox exploded and I was still working at South Park, uh, but my mailbox exploded, like all these possibilities. And although it was one of my big dreams working for Madden Trade and was going quite well, um, I've, uh, in all of these mails, there was one guy, Tom Graham, and I started talking with him and somehow we were on the same page. Uh, like with South Park, we were doing these things, uh, working on, on movies or on, 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 on Hollywood. That was a thing we wanted to work on. But when I was talking with Tom, it was he had a lot of ideas how to use his technology, not just use it for, for movies, for example. We could do it for translations. Uh, we could start making deals with big athletes so they never have to go on stage again. They can they can stay home, focus on their sport. And, and like there were these use cases which are, were really interesting. He also wanted to push addicts going forward and I think that made sense and doing that with Tom just felt good in every in every way because you have to realize 90-90% of the people would have signed a new contract with South Park and would have said like okay I'm going to move to LA and I'm going to work with Man and Trey like that's a given and mm -hmm. I, I always believed like look sometimes you just have to do what feels good and somehow it felt good in my heart to follow what my mind was telling me. Go do it with Tom. And I still have a good band, a good bond with Madden Trey. They're amazing. They understood what I wanted to do and it was all good. And I started doing it with Tom and with my brother as well, by the way. We find we co-founded with me, my brother and Tom. And that's the reason why I started Metaphysic. I wanted to show the, show the world how to use it adequately, push the technology forwards. And, and, and have these different use cases we wanted to work on. Not only face swapping per se. There's a lot of more possibilities. And that's the reason. That's the only reason. That's great. That's really cool. You're using proprietary software for everything you're doing in Metaphysic. Is that right? Yes. That's great. Um, I'm kind of curious for the layman, like someone who's kind of more wanting to get into this stuff, like what is the tools of choice these days that everyone leans to? I'm assuming Deep Face Lab and a couple other tools, but like what would you recommend for someone to be able to do everything that they wanted to get started kind of toying around with? I think FaceWap has good structure. Mm -hmm. FaceWap.dev, 
uh, is a great team and they have a really good structure, uh, uh, pro uh, software structure, if that's how you say it, uh, mm -hmm. to work with. I think that's great. And go on YouTube, go YouTube and, and, and start looking at tutorials. I think that's a great thing um, because you have to know everything I learned from day one to, to where I'm at now, ten, uh, like 10 years before, and now I learn everything myself. So just start start doing it. That's the only way how you can learn it. And and it doesn't matter if you have a budget of a thousand dollars to work with a small GPU. It's it's you just have to start understanding uh, how certain things work. And with this technology, it's like a black box. You're not always certain of what's going to come out of a certain model. So you just have to practice and, and see what it does and see how it reacts. And that's how you learn it. Also go through GitHub. Start start going through all these all these repositories because that's that's the goal, right? Like like uh, colorizing black and white videos to, to to full color. How do you do that? There are tons of different repositories that cover that. It's difficult for me to give you like specific names because it's been a while now. Yeah, just go around and, and, and see see what you can find. Cool, uh, I definitely will. I'm I'm curious as well. Like you and Tom Graham recently auditioned for. Season 17 of America's Got Talent, as you mentioned before. What was that experience like? I'm just kind of curious because it, it uh, looked like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember Tom's told me, uh, like, I think nine months ago or something, hey, we should do America's Got Talent. Let's go on stage. And I told him, like, you're crazy. What are we going to do there? Like, I'm not going to dance or whatever. I was like, no, but whatever. It sounds, it, it, it sounds like something we should do. And yeah, then a few few months later, we were like, okay, you know what? Let's do it. Let's let's find a way out to do it. And the experience was insane because before we went on stage, we didn't have to do the performance. Yeah, we already did a lot of work preparing certain things, and let's just hope everything goes well, right? Yeah, I think right before we went on stage, it was nerve wracking, and somehow, and I think for the semifinals, it'll be even worse because. You did an audition right now. That's 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 crazy. People were amazed, but people know what to expect right now. So you have to raise the bar in so many ways. And that's what I love about it, right? Like you're back against the wall and just figure it out. You have a limited amount of time. Let's figure it out. So for the semifinals, we're aiming for multiple camera angles, multiple persons. Wow. And yeah. And uh, if we reach the finals will have something extremely special something no one will expect but we have to reach the finals the thing with this technology is we already have to start preparing so we're currently working on the semi-finals and the finals at the same time <laughs> in the meantime the team is also working on a few clients so it's a big mess right now uh as in workload wise but mm -hmm. we're loving it and 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 it's going to open so much new upper uh, open up to so much new opportunities if you can pull this up so i think i think it's great and it's also a great way to show the world what this technology is capable of mm -hmm. entertainment wise right just imagine like in the future you can go to a concert of of the beatles when the uh back in the 70s and you can go there and it's like hyper real holograms and, and hyper real voices it's all synthetic and you're like enjoying that performance when they were like at their top because we never had the chance to experience that, right? Yeah, it's it's really amazing just to kind of see where all this could go. And um, especially doing something like, like uh, America's Got Talent, like it's not as straightforward, I'd imagine, as just, you know, no. doing a couple of face replacements. It's a lot of thinking, but a lot of planning. It's as mainstream as you can get, right? It's the perfect stage. Like it's, it's the best PR thing we could ever do, I think, as well. Like, and I think something i didn't mention but we also have this platform that we created like almost a year ago now i think and uh it's named synthetic futures where every three months we have eight panels and every panel is like one hour and they're like five to six people on each panel and it's always talking about uh synthetic media uh how it's being used abuse talking with lawyers talking with copyrights uh, specialists like all these types of people so that's also a way of us to guide the technology in, ad in an ethical way to pave the way like how can we use it what have what do we have to think of like what like what, what legislation is coming uh, all these kind of things so i think that's that's important uh, that i said it as well
Yeah, no, I think it's one of those things that you don't really think about straight away, but it has such a, a massive influence on everything. Your whole experience with social media as well, as we've already touched on, like for you, when you started posting, um, especially the Tom Cruise uh, deepfakes, like how instant was it that you started getting traction with those videos? So yeah, the TikTok account blew up uh, <laughs> and it, it took a while, like a few weeks before we came out that we were doing it. Eh? And that was another situation, like Deep Tom Cruise was blowing up. Everyone was writing about it. It got millions and millions and millions of views. And at that moment, a lot of journalists started writing articles about it, about, okay, now is the end of the world is in sight. Like everyone can do this now. It's, it's, it's gone. It's, it's over. And that's when I started talking with Miles, the actor, and I, I told him like, look, I have to come out and talk about it because they're misrepresenting what this technology is, like how easy it is eh? uh, and all these kind of things. I've never done an interview before that day. Uh, by the way, I've done small ones, but not big ones. Me and bro my brother, we took together, set up like 50 interviews in two days. Well, wow. BBC, CNET, uh, what else? Fortune all the, these big ones like even ja in japan france everywhere all the big ones and that the the agreement we had was like let's do these interviews and on friday 4 p.m belgian time you can all release it on the same time like no one knows who's creating who's creating these videos but then you can release it right as a premiere mm -hmm. so we did all these interviews we prepared it a bit so i had answers to all to all these difficult questions like how easy is, is it to do and i told them like look i'm a professional uh, vfx artist I, ai artist at what i'm doing i've got professional hardware i'm working with one of the best actors uh which uh, like he can impersonate tom cruise on another level he looks similar that's 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 uh that's a big thing as well so somehow all of these conversations went extremely well because it could backfire as well. Mm -hmm. And on Friday, the articles came out and was insane. The whole world exploded. And it just, it was such, so positive, right? And it, it changed my life from that day. Um, and that's when my Instagram went up a bit. Um, of course, I didn't have the, the the Instagram of Deep Tom Cruise because someone else took that before me, sadly. But okay, my own Instagram uh, went went well. My mailbox was full, and that's how I came in contact with Tom Grant to start up Metaphysics. So it's all it's all good. I love that, and yeah, one thing leads to another. So it's yeah, um, yeah. that's really cool. I'm curious too. Uh, what would you say is probably the craziest or funnest project that you've worked on to date? craziest and funnest projects i think the craziest is still deep tom cruise as in the humor we put into that it's like tom cruise eating a popsicle like it doesn't make sense and that's what makes it so <laughs> funny right it makes it so funny and and i, I think I, I i love the humor we put into those and we put in those videos and it's all miles by the way uh he's, mm -hmm. he's he knows how to handle that and the crazier projects we're currently working on. I think AGT is a good example as well, um, especially if you move from the auditions to the semifinal. I think that's where you have to show off that you're capable of of raising the bar in a short amount of time. And I think that's really interesting. And and yeah, one of the most funny projects was Sassy Justice as well. I think uh, that was that was that was really good. Yeah. I love when I meet someone who hasn't seen it yet because it's just like, I'm sending you a link right now. You know, it's, um, yeah, it, I thought it was brilliant, especially yeah. given the time when, uh, you know, we're going through COVID and like at the beginning when, yeah, like in a lot of ways, finding something fun that kind of distract you for a few minutes was extremely valuable. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It was really good. Yeah, I'm wondering what you're coming up with soon, but uh, well, let's see, right? <laughs> I hope right. they'll wait after the semifinals so we can take the spotlight once more and then uh, mm -hmm. it's a big world there are a lot of possibilities so it's all good I still have contact with a lot of those guys by the way the the, the AI guys on the team and stuff like it's one small community right like three years ago we all started like in a small discord of 12 people mm -hmm. all working together changing the narrative of how this technology is being used and now it's I'm at metaphysic like five people are at South Park, for example. There's one at uh, ILM, or a few guys are working there and there. Like they're all at the big companies, leaders in the industry. And it's like, we started together three years ago. It's insane. And it's 
cool. it, it makes me feel proud of them. So that's cool. Yeah. I guess one or two final questions would be, um, I'm just kind of curious about this. Like when you do take on a project, how do you, I wouldn't say budget it out, but schedule it out in the sense that it isn't a fast turnaround. It's not like you're you're working in Nuke or After Effects, rotoing some stuff. You're having to train a model. You need to go through the process, fix things, go back again. Um, it's a pretty time consuming process. So do you have to educate your clients a lot of time on the process first and give oh. fairly wide schedules to accommodate everything? Yeah, yeah. So we we'll always have to educate the client to begin with. Huh? Uh, what uh, what the technology is, what we can do, and in a lot of cases, uh, in one of the first conversations, sometimes they know what they want exactly, and sometimes they're not sure. And what I do then is come up with creative solutions. Right? It's not always a, an A B Facebook. That's not always what it. What, that's not always the case. So I always have to tell them, talk with uh, them, and educate them about the uh, uh, limitations we have technology wise what we can do or maybe combining a few technologies and the thing i'm really bad at is giving an es estimation as in time wise so that's where my colleagues come in my team um and it's not a fast turnaround for sure like eight nine weeks at least uh, to, to 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 make sure that the models are trained uh, uh to a certain degree um and doing the post-production on top um, so it's 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 it's, 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 it's another way of thinking for the client. But in a lot of cases, for example, Alu Black, when he came in, he was like, "I don't know what I want to do, but I love your technology. What can we do?" And then I told him like, "We could translate your songs. What do you think about that?" Mm -hmm. He said like, "I'm coming back tomorrow," because the first thing he asked me like, he wanted to do Zoom meetings. And and what if he was in the shower or something, and he or he was dirty, and he he said like, can I do a Zoom meeting where I have like my avatar talking? I said like, yeah, soon, but not now. And then he told me like, what else can we do? And that's how we got to the point where we were translating his song, right? And that's how we sometimes get to certain projects as well. Cool, I love that. Um, is there any specific tech or innovations, things that you've got your eye on that are coming down the pipe or available right now, like things that you're excited about for the future that um, is starting to come out. And again, that could be software, hardware, you know, algorithms, whatever. We're working hard on the translation part, automa automating that. And I think that'll be a game changer um, for for a lot of productions and, and, and things like that. And, and maybe it's a bit, maybe I have to think more like what else is there, like the, which I think is amazing having your own real likeness, transferring that to, to uh, hyper real into a game or something like that. I think that would be cool as well. Playing FIFA or playing Call of Duty with my face, right? that would be yeah, not pretty to look at, but it would be cool, <laughs> right? Like, And if I would like, move from Call of Duty to World of Warcraft in the future with my hyper real likeness, like people will know, hey, that that's that guy, you know? And I think that would be cool um, in the short term. Long term, I want to have breakfast with my grandparents. That's that's my long term goal. Uh, but for now, I think that'll be cool. And the translation part as well. I think that'll be a game changer for a lot of musicians uh, and, and, and actually everyone all over the world. I think it'll make sure information is easier, is easy accessible for a lot of people of different like uh, which are speaking different languages. Yeah, the possibilities are endless, that's for sure. And Chris, I want to thank you for taking time to chat. This has been awesome. Where can people go to find out more about you and all the exciting things you're doing at Meta Metaphysic? You could just go on TikTok, go to Deep Tom Cruise, or um, find me on VFX Chris Hume, uh, C H R I S U M E, uh, on my Instagram. That's where I mostly post uh, latest uh, videos and uh, things. And 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 through my my uh, socials, you can also get to Metaphysic what we're doing at Metaphysic. And by the time this comes out, we'll already, uh, we'll know if we reach the finals or not. Whatever happens, right? It's been a fun ride and, and uh, I hope I made some people smile. And I think that's what makes me happy in the end. That uh, That's exactly what I was thinking when we were on stage, uh, when we were watching the singer on stage, like, I hope people are enjoying this and are smiling. And, and that's why you do it as an artist, right? That's it, that's it. People people lo loved it, so that made me, it made me happy. That's great, Chris. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Okay, thanks for having me.